This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. So my topic today is the incarnation of wisdom in pre-Christian Judaism. And there's a lot of data to go over in the presentation today. I understand that a title like this is probably something that you're not quite looking at and thinking, yeah, that's something I'm already convinced of. So I know I have an uphill battle with many of you, but I think that the the data is there. I think that the data is there, and I think that this is really going to change the way that we come to appreciate uh, the ways in which Jesus is portrayed as the embodiment of wisdom, and of course, the embodiment of the word within the New Testament. So what is the aim of today's presentation? The aim of the study is to ascertain to what extent the concept of incarnation appears in pre-Christian Jewish sources, okay? Now, it's very important when you are having conversations like this that you need to define your terms, okay? What do I mean by incarnation? There are many people that just think that incarnation is a terrible word and that we should not be using incarnation in regard to what is said in the Gospel of John. So my definition of incarnation, which is a noun, is the act wherein the pre-existing word or its close synonym wisdom becomes flesh and lives on earth among the people. Okay, so there's a word that pre-exists, and wisdom is a close parallel to word, and it becomes flesh and it lives on earth among the people. So, the current scholarly assumption in regard to the Gospel of John is this. The theology of incarnation finds its origin specifically in John 1.14, where the pre-existing word, or wisdom, becomes flesh and pitches its tent among the Johannine community. This effectively sets a date for the theology of incarnation to roughly the end of the first century when the fourth gospel arrived at its final form. So this is the current scholarly assumption on the origins of incarnation. We just look at John 1.14, we date that text, that's when theology of incarnation begins. And so here are some quotes to make that particular point. Uh, This scholar, uh, Dr. Scott, says that the word became flesh is a step beyond anything said directly of Sophia in the tradition. Sophia is the Greek noun for wisdom. So he's making the argument that what is being said here in John 1.14 is beyond anything that's already said of the wisdom tradition. Our next scholar, uh, who wrote uh, two volumes uh, of commentary on the Gospel of John, says the author of the hymn is now describing something that he did not derive from the old wisdom tradition. In other words, the prologue is doing something brand new. And then we can even look at uh, Dr. Lincoln's commentary, who says that this formulation goes far beyond any personification of the divine wisdom to claim that this wisdom has become incarnate in a particular human. Notice, by the way, that these scholars already understand that wisdom is a, uh, is, is a parallel for word. It is a, a synonym for word. But this commentator is saying that this has gone far beyond anything that is ever said about wisdom becoming incarnate. So that's what uh, scholars are saying on the Gospel of John. However, there are many scholars of the Second Temple Judaism, of Second Temple Judaism, that have observed that the personified wisdom of God is portrayed as becoming human, becoming incarnate in the flesh of noteworthy individuals. So we got some scholars that say that incarnation begins in the Gospel of John, in John 1.14. We have some other scholars that say, no, it's actually there in pre-Christian Judaism, in Second Temple Judaism. Both scholars can't be right, okay? So our job today is to ascertain where it begins. So what are we going to be looking at in our study today? Well, the flow of the argument, we're going to start with the book of Proverbs. That's the earliest place to where personified wisdom appears in our literature. We're going to move, we're going to, move to the book of Sirach, which is also called Ben Sirah. Then we're going to move to a document that I imagine none of you have looked at before called the Genesis Apocryphon. It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then we'll move to the first century looking at the writings of Philo. And then finally, we will end at the prologue of John's Gospel. Buckle up, here we go. All right. Proverbs. <clears throat> now, Proverbs chapters 1 through 9, obviously the first nine chapters, and chapter 31, the final chapter, bookend the collection of Proverbs. And these chapters are the largest hub of personified wisdom text 
that appear uh, within the book of Proverbs. So uh, most of the wisdom uh, texts, personified wisdom texts, are going to be in these chapters. And scholars date the composition of these chapters, 1 through 9 and 31, to the Persian period, so around 400. So this is probably the earliest we can date personified wisdom text. So when you open the book of Proverbs, you start in chapter 1, you can see that wisdom is introduced in a fairly casual way. To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. So what is wisdom? Well, the parallel tells us that wisdom is just instruction. There are sayings of understanding. There are instructions in wise behavior. We get it. They're just they're wise teachings that God gives. A few verses later, in verses 7 through 8, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Again, what is wisdom here? Well, it's just instruction. It's a teaching from your father. It's the instruction from your mother. But quite quickly, wisdom becomes heavily personified in the very same chapter. Starting in 120, wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square at the head of the noisy streets. She cries out at the entrance of the gates in the city. She utters her sayings. How long, O oh naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate my knowledge. Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Notice, by the way, again, wisdom is closely associated with the words of God. Wisdom speaks forth God's words. What about in chapter 2? Chapter 2 says, make your ear attentive to wisdom. The parallel says, Incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as you, uh, you would for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of Yahweh and discover the knowledge of God. For Yahweh gives wisdom from his mouth. Remember wisdom, words of God from the mouth. Come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. So again, we can see that God's wisdom is closely associated with the words of God. But then in chapter 3, uh, we can see the personification of wisdom again. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her profit is better than the profit of silver and her gain better than, the, than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand. And in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all of her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who hold her fast. And then Yahweh, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. So we could see wisdom being personified as something you should seek after and gain, and it means to seek after the wise teachings of God and to embrace them and to follow them. We can also see that wisdom is so important for you to acquire that God himself used wisdom as the personified agent to bring about creation. Yahweh, by wisdom, founded the earth. And you can see there that wisdom is not a conscious female alongside God because it's paralleled with God's understanding. What about chapter 8? Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? Besides the gates, she cries out, quote, Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold, and my yield better than choice of silver. Then I was beside him as a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. So there's a heavy personification passage there in chapter 8 where wisdom does a lot of speaking in the first person. And then we see another one in the first six verses of chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out seven pillars. She has prepared her bread. She has mixed her wine. Sounds like communion, by the way. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maidens. She's got some female servants. She calls from the top of the heights of the city, quote, whoever is naive, let him turn in here. To him who lacks understanding, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. So the first nine chapters of Proverbs, we get a sense that we have the wisdom of God. 
It's God's wise instruction. It's his ways that are lead to understanding. But also it is heavily personified as a female figure, but it's not a conscious female alongside God. But then when you get to the very last chapter, chapter 31, we have this description of what's sometimes called the woman of strength or a wife or a woman of substance. It can be translated in a variety of ways. And what does it say about her? In Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10, a woman of substance who can find her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like ships that bring profit. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives bread to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. And from the fruit of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. The passage goes on. Her husband is known at the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the future. Now, if you read these passages in Hebrew, something very interesting is clear. We can see that this woman, this ideal wife, is the personification, the embodiment of personified wisdom. How do we know? Well, we've already seen that personified wisdom is more profitable than jewels. She offers good things. She hates evil things. She is full of delight. She brings forth profit. She offers bread. She's a homeowner. She works with maidens who serve her. She is bearing fruit. She is speaking at the city gates, and she is engaging in laughter. We read all of those passages, but guess what? The same Hebrew words, the very same Hebrew phrases, are used to describe the ideal wife, the woman of substance. Guess what? She is more profitable than jewels. She offers good things. She hates evil things. She's full of delight, bringing forth profit, offering bread. She's a homeowner. She works with maidens who serve her. She bears fruit. She speaks at the city gates, and she is engaging in laughter. Anyone reading the Hebrew would see that the author is portraying this woman as the incarnation of personified wisdom 500 years before the Gospel of John was written. And if that wasn't enough, a little bit later in the passage, in 31 verse 27, the Hebrew verb that's actually used, which you would say in Hebrew as Sophia, is a bilingual pun for the Greek noun, Sophia. So the author knows exactly what he's doing. He's trying to really clue you in onto this point and a number of scholars have noticed this as they should. Now, that's just my opinion, but modern scholarship is openly admitting that personified wisdom became incarnate in the woman of substance, as in, in the ideal female readers of Proverbs 31 who take wisdom's teachings and apply them to their life. So my former teacher, Leo Perdue, says in his commentary, the woman of substance becomes the human incarnation of what woman wisdom teaches. He goes on, he says that she is the incarnation of wisdom in female form. How about this commentary? The woman of substance is in some ways a real-life incarnation of woman wisdom. How about New Testament scholars? Ben Wetherington III, another one of my former teachers. He said that this woman is indeed the very embodiment of wisdom. She is wisdom truly embodied. Incarnation began in the book of Proverbs. So that's our earliest occurrence of it, in 400 B.C. What about 180? Well, we're going to look at a book called Sirach. And if you don't have an NRSV, you probably don't have this included in your Bible. I'm not suggesting it should be in your Bible. What is the book of Sirach? Well, Sirach is in the collection of the intertestamental Jewish literature that was included in the Greek Bible that we call the Septuagint. And Sirach, interestingly enough, shows clear signs of dependence upon the book of Proverbs, both in its structure and in its theology. And wisdom, the Greek noun Sophia, appears over 90 times in the book of Sirach. And so what we're going to see is that it's been strongly influenced by the portrayal of personified wisdom in Proverbs and arguably the incarnation of wisdom into human figures. Let me make my case. So in chapter 24 of Sirach, we have this long passage that talks about the personification of wisdom. So you can see very similar things to what we saw in Proverbs. Sirach 24, verse 1. Wisdom praises herself and tells of her glory in the midst of her people. 
In the assembly of the Most High, she opens her mouth. Notice again, wisdom is closely associated with the mouth and the words of God. In the presence of his host, she tells of her glory. Quote, I came forth from the mouth of the Most High, again, closely associating wisdom with God's word, and covered the earth like a mist. I dwelt in the highest heavens, and my throne was in a pillar of cloud. Alone I compassed the vault of heaven and traversed the depths of the abyss, over the ways of the sea, over all the earth, and over every people and nation I have held sway. Among all these I sought a resting place, in whose territory should I abide? Then the creator of all things, someone distinguished from her, by the way, uh, gave me a command, and my creator chose the place for my tent. He said, quote, make your dwelling in Jacob, and in Israel receive your inheritance. That's the voice of God. Before the ages, in the beginning, he created me, and for all the ages, I shall not cease to be. In the holy tent, I ministered before him, and so I was established in Zion. Thus, in the beloved city, he gave me a resting place, and in Jerusalem was my domain. I took root in an honored people, and the portion of the Lord, his heritage. I grew tall like a cedar in Lebanon, and like a cypress on the heights of Hermon, I grew tall like the palm tree in Engedi, and like rose bushes in Jericho, like a fair olive tree in the field, and like a plain tree beside the water, I grew tall. Like cassia and camel's thorn, I gave forth perfume, and like choice myrrh, I spread my fragrance. The passage goes on, like the odor of the incense of the tent. This is personified wisdom, heavily, heavily personified, speaking in the first person, saying that she came out of heaven and was dwelling in the midst of Israel. And there's a lot of tree imagery. Didn't wisdom say that she was a tree of life? That's what's said about personified wisdom. But then at the end of the book of Sirach, we have the description of a historical high priest, Simon ben Onias, who was a high priest around the time that the book of Sirach was written. And this is what is said about this particular high priest. It says that the leader, this is Sirach chapter 50, verse 1, the leader of his brothers and the pride of his people was the high priest, Simon, son of Onias, who in his life repaired the house and in his life fortified the temple. How glorious he was surrounded by the people as he came out of the house of a curtain. Like roses in the day of first fruits, like lilies by a spring of water, like a green shoot on Lebanon on a summer day, like fire and incense in the censer, like a vessel of hammered gold studded with all kinds of precious stones, like an olive tree laden with fruit, like a cypress towering in the clouds. When he put on his glorious robe and clothed himself with perfect splendor, when he went up to the holy altar, he made the court of the sanctuary glorious. When he received the portions from the hands of the priest, as he stood by the hearth of the altar with a garland of brothers around him, he was like a young cedar on Lebanon, surrounded by the trunks of palm trees. All the sons of Aaron in their splendor held the Lord's offering in their hands before the whole congregation of Israel, finishing the service at the altars and arranging the offering of the Most High, the Almighty, he held out his hands for the cup and poured a drink offering of the blood of the grape. He poured it out on the foot of the altar and a pleasing odor to the Most High, the King of all. The passage goes on. Then Simon came down and raised his hands over the whole congregation of Israelites to pronounce the blessing of the Lord with his lips and to glory in his name. Now, just like Proverbs, if you read Sirach in Greek, you'll notice something very interesting about the depiction of Simon. You'll notice that earlier in chapter 24, personified wisdom is present in the people's midst. She is likened unto a rose bush. She's likened unto incense, like an olive tree, like a cypress tree, like a cedar tree, like a pleasing fragrance, and she is in possession of God's glory. Guess what? The very same Greek words are intentionally used to describe Simon, the historical high priest. He is present in the people's midst. He is likened unto a rose bush, like incense, an olive tree, a cypress tree, a cedar tree. He is like pleasing fragrance, and he's in possession of God's glory. Clearly, the author, just like the author of, of Proverbs 1 through 9 and 31, is portraying this historical high priest as the incarnation and the embodiment of God's personified wisdom, clearly being influenced by the book of Proverbs. And guess what? Modern scholarship openly admits that personified wisdom became incarnate in Simon ben Onias, as in, in a high priest from history. This is an actual real person that lived. 
All right? So um, Crispin Fletcher Lewis says that she is incarnate in her avatar, Israel's high priest. Okay? Uh, Dr. Schmidt says that Ben Sira sees the high priest as one who transmits wisdom by his own embodiment of wisdom, the preeminent embodiment of wisdom in the world. And even in a commentary that came up just this year, which I was able to purchase, 2023, Dr. Wilson says that in performing his duties, the high priest essentially embodies wisdom. This is what scholars are saying about these passages. They're seeing incarnation in pre-Christian Judaism. All right, two down. Let's look at 100 BC. Here's where it gets a little bit fun. Now we're going to look at the Genesis Apocryphon, okay? This is a document out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? Now, just to be clear, we've looked at Proverbs, written in Hebrew. We've looked at Sirach, which it's now survived in a Greek source, and the Genesis Apocryphon is in Aramaic, okay? So now we've got three languages. Now, what is the Genesis Apocryphon? It is a non-biblical scroll that retells the lives of these three figures, uh, Lamech, Noah, and Abraham, and it's written in Aramaic. It was found in Cave, cave 1 of the Qumran Caves, and it's also known by its shorter form, which is 1Q20. Okay, so I'm not going to just use Genesis Apocrypha on the entire thing. I'm just going to say 1Q20 from here on out. <clears throat> by the way, all the translations of this are my own. What is being said here? So we're going to focus on the retelling of the story of Abraham, which gives a lot of attention to someone named Sarah. So this is Abraham talking in this particular story. I, Abram, dreamt the dream on the night that I entered into Egypt. And in my dream, I saw a cedar tree and a palm tree. Some men arrived, intending to cut and uproot the cedar tree and to leave the palm tree by itself. But the palm tree shouted and said, Do not cut down the cedar tree, for both of us are from a single root. And the cedar tree was saved thanks to the palm tree. And it was not cut down. So you get the story, see what happened. I woke up from my sleep at night and I spoke to Sarah, my wife. I had a dream and I am alarmed by this dream. She said to me, tell unto me your dream in order that I may know it. So I began to tell her the dream and I told her the interpretation of the dream. Now catch this. I said, they wanted to kill me and leave you alone. Okay, so they wanted to cut down one tree, but the other tree shouted and said, don't do this, and the first tree was actually saved. So who was the person that saved whom? Sarah saved Abraham. But guess what it says in the book of Proverbs? Long life is in wisdom's right hand, and her left hand are riches and honors. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all of her paths are peace, and she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who hold her fast. So in the book of Proverbs, we see that wisdom is one that offers life, is one that shows the path of peace and is likened unto a tree. What do we see here? We see Sarah is offering life. She saves the life of Abraham. She offers the path of peace, and she's likened unto a tree. Maybe you're not convinced yet. That's okay. Let's look at another passage in 1Q20. As you're probably familiar with the story in Genesis, Sarah actually gets brought before a king, and in this retelling, the king actually tells us what he thinks about Sarah. This is what the king is saying. He says, how pretty is the shape of her face? How lovely and how smooth is the hair on her head? How lovely are her eyes? How pleasant her nose and all the blossom of her face? How lovely all her fair complexion? How beautiful are her arms, even her hands? How perfect, how alluring is the entire appearance of her hands? How pretty are the palms of her hands, her feet? How lovely, how perfect her thighs. No virgin or wife who enters the bridal chamber is more beautiful than her, more beautiful than Sarah, okay? Her beauty stands out above all women. Her loveliness is far above them all, and notice this here, and with all this beauty, in her is great wisdom. In Sarah is great wisdom. Now, what is said about personified wisdom in Proverbs? How blessed the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding her profit is better than the profit of silver and her gain better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire compares with her. Clearly, no woman you can desire would compare to Sarah. Maybe you're not convinced yet. Let me give you the final one. In the midst of the story, we see similar things like Abraham telling 
uh, Sarah, in every place that we go, say, he is my brother. Or a little bit later in the next chapter, he wanted to kill me, but Sarah said to the king, he is my brother. And then the final one, which is the most important, the king called to me and said to me, what have you done with me in regard to Sarah? You told me she is my sister when she is your wife. Okay, she is my sister. But guess what we see in the book of Proverbs? Say to wisdom, you are my sister. But Abraham said, you are my sister to Sarah. What's going on there? What's going on in the Genesis Apocryphon? Well, guess what? Just like we saw in Proverbs, and just like, just like we saw in Sirach, we see the incarnation of personified wisdom in Sarah, Abraham's wife. So here we got a lovely picture of these, uh, these young, beautiful people. And according to the Genesis Apocryphon, Sarah is likened unto a tree that offers life. Sarah possesses immeasurable value, and Sarah is called my sister. When we look at Proverbs, personified wisdom is likened unto a tree that offers life. She possesses immeasurable value, and she is called my sister. Now, compared to biblical books like Proverbs or the intertestamental books like Sirach, the books in the Dead Sea Scrolls don't get as much scholarly attention. So modern scholars are just now beginning to give further attention to the concept of personified wisdom's incarnation and the figure of Sarah within the Genesis Apocryphon. Uh, in a more recent study, um, Dr. Lipscomb says that the Apocryphon redeems Sarah's reputation from Genesis 12 by recasting her as an embodiment of Lady Wisdom. And he goes on, and he says that wisdom is not only personified, but embodied in the person of Sarah. And he quotes a study in his article from Craig Evans, who says that the beauty of Sarah is described at great length in a particular part of the Genesis Apocryphon, and he says it is a description possibly inspired in places by Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, where he looked at earlier, where the ideal wife, the woman of substance, is the embodiment of wisdom. Scholars are seeing the concept of incarnation in pre-Christian Jewish sources. Maybe you're not convinced yet. Let's keep going. We looked at Proverbs, we looked at Sirach, we've looked at Genesis Apocryphon. Now we can move to the early portions of the first century. We can look at the figure of Philo, Philo Judaeus. It's not very easy to figure out exactly when he wrote, but uh, it's likely that he wrote all of his works before the New Testament writings. Who is Philo? Well, Philo is a Greek-speaking Jew who wrote from Alexandria. He wrote 52 treatises in Greek, which actually makes him a more voluminous author than all the New Testament writers combined. This is why Philo is a very important person to study, even though most New Testament scholars kind of ignore him. Philo uses the noun wisdom. He writes in Greek, so he's going to use the noun Sophia over 200 times in his writings. And... Philo regularly draws upon the theology of the book of Proverbs and Sirach. So we could see the influences upon Philo's depiction of wisdom. Let's begin with Philo. <clears throat> so drawing on the theology of Proverbs, Philo personifies the wisdom of God as a female figure who plays the roles of a wife, a mother, a daughter of God, and a nurse. Here's a quote. The wisdom of God which is the nurse and foster mother and educator of those who desire incorruptible food, for it, as the mother of those things which exist in the world, immediately supplies food to those beings which are brought forth by her. So clearly you can see wisdom being heavily personified as a variety of female figures. Okay? We can also see that wisdom functions as this personified agent through which God created all things, just like we saw in Proverbs. It's also there in Sirach. So, in the next passage in the top right, um, your mother, wisdom, through whom the universe was completed. So, the father is the creator of all things, but God created through this personified female figure described as the mother. Shows up again. God, being his father, Moses' father, in the context, who is also the father of all things. Philo thought that God is the father of all things. And we have wisdom being his mother, Moses' mother, through whom the universe arrived at creation. So God, the Father, created all things, but God created all things through personified wisdom. And then we can see Philo equating the wisdom of God with the Word of God. He says that this river is generic goodness, and this issues forth out of Eden of the wisdom of God, and that is the Word of God. Wisdom 
which is the Logos of God. So Philo just says, in the first century, God's wisdom is God's word. Okay, we've already seen this in Proverbs. We've already seen this in Sirach. It's explicitly stated here by Philo. All right. Now, interestingly enough, Philo is going to portray Sarah as the embodiment of wisdom without any sort of seeming dependence on the Genesis Apocryphon. Sarah seems to be a really popular figure. So look at what is said about Sarah. It says, God also gives a share to Abraham of his own proper appellation, to whom, when he eradicated the pain from, from whom? You would think from Sarah, but actually, Philo says it's from wisdom. He gave rejoicing as an offspring. So here, he is just flat out saying, instead of saying Sarah, I'm just going to say wisdom, because Philo thinks that wisdom has become incarnate in Sarah. He's just going to replace Sarah with wisdom. And he's going to do this for a variety of passages. He says, do you not see that dominant wisdom, which is Sarah, says, for whosoever shall hear it, it uh, sorry, shall laugh with me. And that's a quote from Genesis 21, verse 6. So here, he takes a, quotes a passage from Genesis, which talks about something that Sarah says, and he said, this is what dominant wisdom says. By the way, wisdom is Sarah. And then he says, the mother of Isaac is motherless wisdom. Well, who is Isaac's mother? It's Sarah. He goes and he says that Hagar is the handmaiden of, not Sarah, but wisdom, because wisdom has become incarnate in Sarah. He goes on, top right. And here we are to admire wisdom. She brought forth no child. This is obviously before she had her children. Okay? Uh, next passage. At that time, he says, she shall bring forth a son to you. Quote from Genesis 15, verse 10. And then he explains what the passage means. That is to say, wisdom shall bring forth joy. But Genesis 15, verse 10 is about Sarah. He's saying, wisdom has become Sarah. God calls the names of wisdom and the wise man. So wisdom and the wise man are who? Sarah and Abraham. And then to mourn Sarah's death is to mourn for wisdom. Okay? It's a lot of reading through Philo to find these, these particular points. All right? But guess what? Sarah's not the only person in whom wisdom has become incarnate, according to Philo. We also have Rebekah, two passages here. And so one passage tells of Rebekah's lineage, saying that she was born of Bethuel, which should be interpreted as the daughter of her God. And who is to be considered the daughter of God but wisdom, the firstborn mother of all things. So it's talking about Rebekah, and he's like, well, who is this? It's, it's wisdom. In the next passage, he calls Bethuel, the father of Rebekah, how then can the daughter of God, namely wisdom, be properly called a father? So here it seems to be describing Rebekah also as God's wisdom. And then we also have a passage that deals with Leah and Zipporah, but also it deals with Sarah and Rebekah. You have to read this very carefully. It says that it is plain that the lovers of wisdom, I want you to think who are the lovers of wisdom, must repudiate the outward sense rather than choose it. For is not this quite natural? For the women who live with these men, the lovers of wisdom, the women who live with these men, the lovers of wisdom, are in fact, um, sorry, sorry, are in name indeed wives, but in fact virtues. Sarah is a princess and guide. Rebecca is perseverance and what is good. Leah, again, is virtue, fainting and weary at the long continuance of exertion, which every foolish man declines and avoids and repudiates. And Zipporah, the wife of Moses, is virtue. The passage talks about the lovers of wisdom. We know that's not just a generic way of talking about anyone who loves wisdom. It talks about the men who are married to these women. And then we learn that it's these four women. It's Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Zipporah. But really, they're wisdom. Because Philo is depicting wisdom as becoming incarnate. And not just Sarah, not just Rebecca, but also Leah and Zipporah. Now, I could take all the time and I can show you the quotes from the Philo scholars, but I kind of felt like that's something I needed to cut from this. But I can assure you, this is dominant in Philo scholarship. The scholars of Philo have drawn attention to the incarnation of God's personified wisdom in the persons of Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Zipporah. Okay? So uh, the paper will actually give you the, uh, the specific uh, page numbers if you want to chase up those places. So we looked at four Jewish documents that predate Christianity predate Christian documents, and what do we see? Having established that several Jewish writers incorporated the concept of incarnation in their pre-Christian writings, it is clear 
that the prologue is not the originator of the doctrine. Like, you are not the father of this doctrine. Okay? So even though scholars of the Gospel of John are saying, hey, nothing that's said about wisdom is even close to what's being said here, the evidence begs to differ. So the portrayal of the word slash wisdom that became flesh in John 1.14 is deeply indebted to Judaism, demonstrating continuity between Judaism and early Christianity. So, a question we might ask is, how might the prologue be interpreted if it too is firmly set within the context of Jewish speculation surrounding the incarnation of personified wisdom in noteworthy human beings? Under the assumption that the personified word in the prologue is a synonym for personified wisdom, what sort of wisdom influences might we find if we look for them in the prologue? How many do you think there are? It's only 18 verses. How many there, could there be? 20. 20. But I bet before this presentation, you probably thought the answer was zero. We're not going to look at them all. We don't have enough time, but I have a, a summary slide. So John 1.1a, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, but Proverbs 8.23 says, ages ago, I, wisdom, was set up in the beginning, using the exact phrase, not just our he, but in our he. Wisdom was also in the beginning with God. Okay? Of course, the word was with God in John 1, 1, but wisdom has already said in Proverbs 8 that when he established the heavens, I, wisdom, was there. I was beside him. Uh, John 1, 1, c, which has the problem of translation you probably are aware of. I think it's uh, the word was fully expressive of God. But clearly, wisdom is someone that expresses God. In Wisdom of Solomon, another intertestamental book, it says that for she, wisdom is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. Clearly, wisdom, personified wisdom, fully expresses God. Okay? Um, he was in the beginning with God. I do think that the prologue of John is personifying the word, and so a pronoun uh, is appropriate. Okay? But clearly, wisdom has been personified in Proverbs 120. Wisdom is shouting in the streets. You know, she's like down there in, in the city and she's calling out to people. What about John 1.3? All things were made through him. All things were made through this personified logos. And apart from him, not one thing was made. But look at what is said about wisdom. In Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. A very important passage. Notice this. O God of my ancestors and Lord of mercy, who made all things according to your word and by your wisdom you formed humankind. Notice God made all things by his word and by his wisdom. Word and wisdom are synonymous terms. Anyway, so we can go through, we can look at all these. In him was life. And of course, wisdom says long life was in her right hand. We've already seen that before. Um, here's a good one. Uh, John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness could not overcome it. I think this is directly influenced by this particular passage in Wisdom 7. 29 through 30. So compared to the light, she, wisdom, should just be wisdom, is found to be superior, for it is succeeded by the night, but against wisdom, evil does not prevail. So notice, against wisdom, evil does not prevail. Evil, by the way, described as darkness. What do we see in the prologue? The light shines in the darkness, but darkness could not overcome it. Okay? Many scholars see that John 1.5 is directly drawing upon wisdom, chapter 7. Kind of, I'm still doing good on time. I think we can go through quite a bit of these. Um, we can see the personified word was in the world. The world didn't know him. He came to his own, uh, uh, but uh, his own did not receive him. There's a sense of rejection. Well, was wisdom ever rejected? Proverbs 1, because I, wisdom, called to you, sorry, called and you refused. I stretched up my hand and no one paid attention. You neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. Wisdom was also rejected. But as many as receive him, Receive the embodied word. To them, he gave the right to become children of God. They received the right to become children of God. But look, in Sirach, my child, from your youth, choose discipline. And when you have gray hair, you will still find wisdom. So those who receive wisdom are called children. Those that receive the word are called children. Even to those who believe in his name, belief is the proper response to interacting with the embodied word. And guess what? If they continue believing, they will inherit her. They will inherit wisdom. Believing is the proper response to accepting wisdom. Of course, we've seen in John 1.14, the word became flesh. We saw this, of course, uh, 
that wisdom became incarnate in the obedient women of Proverbs, in the historical high priest Simon ben Onias, in Sarah, according to Genesis Apocryphon, and uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Zipporah in Philo. Okay, so again, John is not saying anything new. He's just saying, actually, uh, wisdom is now embodied in the human Messiah. What else? Okay. Um, and John 1.14 uh, pitched his tent among us. We read this in Sirach. Then the creator of all things gave me wisdom a command, and my creator chose a place for my tent. He said, make your dwelling in Jacob. So uh, the word becomes flesh and pitches its tent in the world. Well, 200 years earlier, Sirach had said that wisdom pitched her tent in the world. All right. And we beheld his glory. And then guess what? Proverbs 8 says that riches and glory are with me. It uses kavod in Hebrew, and it uses doxa in the Septuagint. So wisdom has glory. How about this one? Glory of the unique one. You might translate it as only begotten. That's irrelevant. The point is that it has the adjective monoyunis. So the embodied word is this monoyunis from the Father, but that was already said of personified wisdom earlier in Wisdom chapter 7, verse 22. Wisdom, the fashioner of all things, taught me there is in her a spirit that is intelligent, holy, and unique. The adjective monoyunis in Greek. Okay. We're running short on time, so I'm just going to kind of skip ahead to my summary slide. The point here is that in the Gospel of John, what do we learn about the Logos? 20 things. The Logos was in the beginning. The Logos was with God. The Logos fully expresses God. The Logos is personified. It's the agent of creation. It had life in itself. It brings light to darkness. It was rejected. It is received, uh, it is received by God's children. It results in belief. It became flesh. It dwelt among the people. It reveals God's glory. It's unique. It uses the adjective monoyunis. It brings grace. It brings truth. It's associated with fullness and filling. It thinks uh, favorably about the law of Moses. It has an intimate relationship with God, and it reveals God. But guess what? All 20 of those things were already said about personified wisdom in Jewish sources. Wisdom was in the beginning. It was with God. It fully expresses God. Wisdom is personified. Wisdom is the agent of creation. It had life in itself. Wisdom brings light to darkness. It was rejected. It is received by God's children, resulting in belief. It became flesh. It dwelt among the people. It revealed God's glory. It's called the monogenes, the unique one. It brings grace and truth. It's associated with fullness. It thinks favorably about the law of Moses, and it has an intimate relationship with God, and it reveals God. So I believe that I've demonstrated that the concept of incarnation was in pre-Christian Jewish sources, and the Gospel of John is dependent on this Jewish doctrine. It's not doing something brand new. The newest thing that it's it's doing is that it's saying that Jesus is the now climactic and final place in which wisdom or word has become incarnate. Thank you.